Hello everyone and welcome again to another episode of M365 Voice. My name is Mike Marani. I'm Sarah Hazi. And I'm Antonio Meyer. And today we will be talking about another interesting topic uh, in regards to uh, protecting uh, global admin accounts. Uh, we always uh, run into this question or issue on how to make sure that the global admin accounts are well secured and how much power they have. How can we protect content also from the global admins if you have to follow into specific regulations and compliance? So uh, between Sarah and Antonio, not sure what your experience is, if we can start sharing some of the thoughts on that. Well, My thoughts are a lot of times I think companies uh, may not necessarily think through all of the ramifications of managing their global admin accounts. Um, initially before they um, go live on Microsoft 365, but eventually most of the companies that I know that are in a more regulated industry sooner or later have to get to that point. And then it's a massive cleanup effort um, to be able to get those global admin accounts uh, into line with where they need to be. Right, right. Uh, as we all know, the global admin account is the all powerful account that can access all settings, all configurations. Um, it has the power to give themselves access to all content within your N365 environment. So like from a security perspective, we think of that as a really large attack surface, right? If you've got global admin accounts that have standing access, which means they have access all the time, and you have a large number of them, you think of it as the organization has a large attack surface, right? An attacker has a lot of opportunity or more opportunity to um, get a high level of access to the tenant, um, whereas if they had less global admin accounts or um, global admin accounts did not have standing access. So you also have to think about your internal bad actors um, that yes. you may or may not have. And we all would like to think that we don't have any bad actors in our organizations, but how many people have access to that global admin account? And how often do you have to change those security protocols or limit the volume of people that have that global admin account because you may have bad actors outside your organization, but you may also have bad actors internal to your organization. That's a great point. Um, when you do have multiple global admin accounts, typically they fall into two camps. Um, if people have global admin accounts, um, you want them to have specific named accounts, right? So if I'm a global admin and a tenant, nobody else is going to access my global admin account. It's mine. I have the password. I access it. The second camp is you often have your emergency accounts or your sometimes called the break glass accounts, um, which are there for some very specific purposes. Um, and that typically is an account that might be shared with a small number of people. Um, some organizations have one break glass account. Some have two. Um, and um, usually it has a very long password. It does not have MFA configured for it. And you, you know, that password is very long. It's very random. And you um, keep the password secure, typically um, encrypted somewhere, um, sometimes printed in a safe somewhere, depending on the organization. But go ahead, Mike. No, so from that perspective, uh, what measures should we take to protect those accounts? So we, we've we talked about, yes, we're going to have to limit the number of global admins. Uh, and then Microsoft now, they tell you that if you go through the secure score and they tell you, oh, you have too many global admins, you're just going to have to reduce them. Uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, so limit the number of global admins, but from a global admin perspective, that let's say we only have to in, a, in, a, in an organization and a tenant, you still have to take measures to protect them. Right. Because you just cannot go and let the global admins go and do whatever they want anytime they want. Um, from um, hacking perspective, from the power perspective as well. So what are the measures also that we should take against making sure the actual account is protected? and the data is protected from the GA as well. And I'm even gonna say you need to make sure that your configuration settings are protected, meaning that I think that you need to think about this in terms of you might have a very small number of people who have access to a global admin account, but you should also have a governing body that makes decisions about your overall tenant level settings, meaning that those global admin users should be making very specific configuration changes or should be going in to take action based, based on a very 
specific series of incidences or critical factors. They should not just be going in and making changes that are not specified or tracked somewhere or done and decided on by a larger group. Right, absolutely. So, so to protect the global admin account, if we start there, we usually limit the number of global admin accounts you have, right? So any tenant should have a minimum of, and this is partly opinion, partly what Microsoft has stated, partly what we've seen successful with organizations. Any tenant should have a minimum of two global admin accounts and an absolute maximum of four. It's gonna to depend to some degree on the size of the organization, how many you have. And if you have to have global admins that are say geographically dispersed, uh, but typically it's somewhere between two and four. I've occasionally seen five and even that is acceptable, but organizations that I've seen have 10, 12, 20, 40 global admin accounts, that absolutely should not be. Um, the global admin account should have, you know, a minimum, I like to say a 16 character long password um, with randomization through the password. Um, uh, MFA, absolutely. Um, Microsoft Authenticator as the MFA requirement as well. I um, mean, usually a requirement to change it on a fairly regular basis. I know NIST guidelines are now saying don't change your password as much, but Global admin, we still like to keep it min 16 characters, lots of randomization and um, changed on some sort of regular basis. Um, and then um, in large organizations, if you're gonna be a global admin, your global admin account should be different from your account that you use every day to check email and open documents and surf teams and communicate with team members. That's a really good point because I've talked to a lot of organizations where they don't have a differentiation between if right. Mike and Antonio are both global admins, that this should not be your primary AD account right. that is being used for that global admin role. Exactly. And then when you are, you do have a separate admin account that is a global admin account, that account ideally does not have a mailbox. Right, so you do not configure it with mailbox because the primary attack vector is still phishing emails. So that global admin account can't receive email. You've kind of locked out one. That's um, a great point. Vector. Now that said, it does make some configurations difficult or challenging because sometimes, you know, when you go and configure something, email notifications will be sent to the person that configured it. So you do need to be a little bit careful with that, but that's often what we like to say. Um, I've seen also organizations where they take a couple of extra steps. One is even if you have a separate account as a global admin, uh, you have to have a privilege of any management implemented. And, and you can't really access your anything in, in the administration wise in, uh, in the tenant if you don't go and submit a request. Some organizations say, okay, I'm going to just submit a request and we're just going to activate my role. And wait until it's active, and then I'm going to give you access. Or some organizations, because based on compliance, it has to be approved. So right. before you get access to it, someone will approve it, verify the description, really valid description. You get approved, and then you have access to it. So that has an extra layer of security to it. And it's gone through because this account is a GA with the conditional access. They said uh, you cannot access it from outside of the country. So location-based okay. access is required for that as well. Yep. So PIM, Privilege Identity Management, if you've got Azure AD Premium P2 licenses, which is what that requires, then absolutely you should make use of PIM. If you don't have PIM, like you don't have the licenses for it, well, then I think all those other measures still apply because you can still do that with, you know, um, E3 licenses, for example, or um, Azure AD Premium P1 licenses. But if you've got PIM, absolutely should make use of it. And it's got kind of three key features. One is um, uh, just-in-time admin access, which is what you pointed to, Mike, right? No global admins have standing access. If I need to access that global admin account, I need to go and activate it. In some cases, and only certain users are eligible to activate it as well. So there's that. You kind of restrict who is eligible for global admin, and then the global admins can go activate it. You can configure approval. For that activation and then you can restrict the access for a certain amount of time so it automatically expires after four hours or eight hours and i think the max is 24 hours but i don't sure not sure if i remember that correctly um so yeah all that just in time and min access is brilliant and and what that kind of leads you to is a goal of 
no global, no people with global admin access, um, uh, a standing access, right? What, what in the ideal case, what you want for your tenant is the only accounts that are global admin and have standing access is your emergency accounts. And no other global admin has standing access. In order to get access, you have to go through PIM, activate, get approval. The second cool feature in PIM is um, uh, uh, um, you can audit the access. So you can have notifications sent, you can audit that global admin access and any admin role on a regular basis. Um, and then the third is you can automate um, privileged access reviews on some sort of regular basis. So let's say every three months, every six months, every year to have an automated review of should all these people still have access to these admin accounts? So yeah, if you've got PIM, it's fantastic. Exactly. So we've talked about protecting the actual account. As, as a GA, uh, like earlier you said that you have access to all the content. You can't find your way to right. go and access specific content Teams, SharePoint, OneDrive, whatever. Right. Um, in some organizations, this is a big concern if you have very confidential information, very private and personal information. Is there a way to kind of protect that? I know we know that as an admin, you always have to kind of give them access to go and fix things, but that comes to a cost as well. Right. So uh, it's a great question. It's something that we're working on. Um, if you have to wall off part of your M365 environment, so not even your global admins can access that content. What I would propose, and we're, again, we're still working on this, is um, you do need to use a very layered approach and make use of uh, many of the different security features to, to control access by global admins. Um, so for example, the feature we just described, privilege identity management, absolutely that should be part of the strategy to secure content that is that sensitive, right? So that if a global admin is going to get access to the tenant, they have to go activate their global admin role, they have to go through approval, notifications get sent, and um, it is audited. And it's the time is restricted heavily as well. So that's, that's one tactic that you will use. The second tactic that you'll use is likely um, uh, uh, Microsoft information protection and sensitivity labels to encrypt content with a specific sensitivity label or a set of sensitivity labels for that content. And you encrypt it such that the, um, uh, you know, only a certain set of users um, have access to it. And the global admins probably will not be part of that level of users. Now, just using, sorry, just using sensitivity labels is not really enough because um, whenever you roll out sensitivity labels, there's a thing in the background you configure called the super user account. And the super user account is that account that enables you to decrypt all content um, in case the people it was encrypted for are no longer with the organization. So you wanna control access to that super user account as well, because that typically is your global admins that have access to that. So then you, you control that also through PIM, because you can assign that role to a, a group an Azure AD group, and then you can control access to that Azure AD group also through PIM. So you see how this is kind of connecting. Um, and then another tactic would be conditional access policies, which you kind of talked about, Mike, where um, you want to enable access only to the global admin account, only from in-country, only from managed devices, perhaps other restrictions as well. Those are kind of three tactics that we're looking at now. Um, around that. I don't know, do you guys have other ideas around that? Um, Not other ideas around that, but I keep on swirling back to the same concept of having a layered approach that is driven by your security and risk tolerance and requirements for your organization is going to be very important. And to go back to something I said before, you also need a governing body that is going to be primarily directed by people who do not have global admin access, but is going to be making decisions at a probably a much higher stakeholder level um, that then those decisions need to be implemented by global admins or carried out by global admins is going to be very important. That's a great point, actually. So like if you're going to access the global admin account, it should be for you know, approved changes. 
And those changes should go through, like you're saying, Sarah, a formal change request process that gets reviewed and approved by a governing body. And only then do, you know, is approval given. And then the or people that- fix, Or a break fix process, which again, should be uh, taken into account from an overall uh, ITIL perspective in terms of managing to be traced back to specific incidents and items that needed to be uh, fixed. Absolutely. And I think another important point you pointed to was um, what we like to call separation of duties, right? So the people that are giving the approval that are making decisions about the architecture and the changes, they should not have access to global admin accounts because it's too easy for them to say, oh, I know how to do this. I'm just going to go and do this change. Uh, like us, like any of us, um, uh, you know, you tend to have a group that does architecture and approvals and another group that does operations and they have different levels of access. Great. And you need to determine a level of granularity as well as a level of specificity around what needs to constitute a change request. Um, and in many cases, I hear people saying things like, well, it's just a few clicks to make the change. This should never be a delineation of what is a change request or a formalized change versus a non-formalized change. Because it doesn't matter if it takes less than two minutes to implement. You need to determine based on the requirements of your organization and industry what, constitute, what constitutes a change and what levels of approval are required, not based on time to implement said change. Exactly. Well, that uh, was a really interesting topic. Uh, loved uh, the different ideas we've had. Thank you both for being here and contributing to the topic. Thanks for everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, everybody.